Albert stood next to the car as the final suitcases were loaded. Gary walked out and put a pillow in the back seat along with a headset radio. He stood there a while, like Albert, scuffing the ground with his feet. It was a warm, clear day, the beginning of summer. The two 14-year-old boys should have been happy that school was over for nearly three months. Instead, they were both closer to tears than they would care to admit. How far is it to California? Albert asked. 1,300 miles, the drive's supposed to take four days. Dad wants to stop along the way and see stuff, Gary said. This bites big time, you know. Why'd your dad have to go get another job anyway? Albert asked, kicking the tire of the 10-year-old Volvo station wagon. Dad said he's going to make twice as much working for this new company and he's doing this for our own good. Gary told him. He was looking around. It was as if he was trying to memorize the only street he could remember living on in his 14 years. Maybe you can come visit on vacation breaks, Albert said. Or you could come visit me. Gary replied, not really believing it would happen. Yeah sure, Albert said dejectedly. He knew the chances were slim as well. From her front room, Albert's mother watched her son say goodbye to his best friend. The two had known each other since they were old enough to walk. The families had lived next door to each other for nearly 13 years now. It was uncommon in the 90s for younger families to live in one place for that long. The Connors, Albert's family, had inherited their home from Jane's father. It was an older home but much larger than they could have afforded if they had tried to buy one. The Grady's, Gary's family, were renting. They had massive medical bills from Gary's extreme youth when he had a congenital heart condition. Gary's father didn't have medical insurance then. Fortunately, Gary's health improved following open-heart surgery and he was a happy and healthy young man, if somewhat small for his age. Sam Grady, Gary's dad, had finally managed to pay off the bills and then he completed his Microsoft certification courses. He was offered several good jobs. The best was in Southern California. That was where they were moving, today. Jane Connor would have to be extra attentive of her son and only child in the next few weeks, maybe even months. It was an older neighborhood. The two boys in the front yard of the Grady's former home were the only two children within blocks. Albert was about to lose the closet thing he had to a brother. Bill Connor was a hard-working and intelligent man. He already had a plan to help fill the void left by Gary. He was installing a basketball goal in the backyard now and there was a fishing trip scheduled for this weekend, just Albert and him. Albert was a smart and resourceful boy. He would make it through this, his parents were sure, and they would be there to help him. Sam and his wife Barbara came out of the house and locked the door. Barbara was teary-eyed. Sam was trying to look confident. He knew he was taking his family far away from their friends and other family but the offer was too good to turn down. He really did have his family in mind when he accepted the job. Jane and Bill came over and said goodbye. Jane and Barbara hugged and cried openly. Sam and Bill shook hands and made small talk about the drive and the best route out of town. Gary and Albert looked at each other and weren't sure what to do. They both felt like crying but they were boys. If they had been girls it would have been easier. Finally, Albert stuck out his hand and Gary shook it. Bye, Gary, it's been great having you for a friend, Albert said bravely. Bye, Albert, was all Gary could manage. Jane and Barbara watched their sons and held their breath, waiting for the worst. Albert turned and went into the house and Gary climbed into the back of the car. Sam and Barbara got in the front and drove off while Jane and Bill watched. Jane looked at Bill and sighed. I'm going to miss them, Bill. They were like family. Jane said while wiping fresh tears from her face. Me too, honey, me too, he said, his voice uncommonly husky suddenly. They walked back into their home, arm in arm. Albert was staring at the TV and flipping through the channels, not really staying on one long enough to see what was playing. Jane sat down beside him. You know, Albert, it's okay to cry when you're sad. No one would think anything bad if you did, Jane told her son. She reached out and put her arm around his shoulder. He's my best friend and he's gone. 
I'll never see him again, he may as well have died. Albert said, loud and hoarse. He collapsed into sobs. His mother held and rocked him like he was much younger. It's okay, Albert, it's okay. It'll get better in time, I promise you. You can call Gary and talk to him anytime you want. Maybe you can visit him or he can come visit you. Jane held her son for some time as he vented his grief over the loss of his friend. Jane was right about it getting better. Albert threw himself into basketball and made the team in his junior high and in high school as well. He and his father had a good relationship and that helped. Time passed and Albert's senior year rolled around. Albert opened his locker and hung his letter jacket up. It was the first day of class for his senior year and he hadn't acquired any books yet. When he closed the door to the locker, it revealed the face of another boy, shorter and almost frail looking. He wore glasses and a big grin. They still call you Albert or is it Al now? Albert's jaw dropped open when he recognized the other boy. Gary? Where the hell did you come from? California, we just moved back here. We got in yesterday and I was real busy unpacking and getting ready for school today so I didn't have a chance to call, plus, they haven't connected our phone yet. I hear you're a big basketball star, Gary said. Well, I'm on the team, what about you, what sport do you play? I don't, the school system won't let me play a sport because of my medical history. I play a mean game of chess though and I'm heavy into computers, like my dad. What classes are you in? Gary said. They compared schedules and discovered they only shared a study hall in third period. I'll see you then and we'll get caught up some more. I have to go my homeroom is the other side of the building. I just happened to see you walk in and I followed you to your locker. God Albert, it's great to see you again, Gary said. Same here man, same here, Albert said as Gary walked away. The two friends talked during study hall until told to be quiet by Mrs. Forrest, the monitor. They met after school and Gary watched Albert during basketball practice. They quickly grew close again over the next few weeks. Albert hadn't realized how much he had missed his old friend. Gary's parents had bought a new home on the south part of town, not too far from Albert's house. The two friends divided their time between the two houses. They both owned cars so getting around was not a problem. Albert had dated a girl the year before who moved to Ohio at the end of the summer so he was between girlfriends. His tall, good-looking body and handsome face as well as his stature as a jock made him a prime catch in the eyes of many of the girls in the senior class. He could have his pick of any of them but truth be told, he missed Helen, who he had dated the entire previous year. He wasn't ready to date someone else just yet. Gary was the new kid and small. His glasses and high grade point average had him labeled a geek by the end of the first month. Add the fact that the two longtime friends were seen together often and rumors began to sprout up about them. One sat Saturday, Albert was checking the oil and water on his car when his next door neighbor Carrie came over to see him. Carrie was a senior as well and one of the prettiest girls in school. She and her parents had moved into the vacant house three months after Gary and his parents moved out. Albert and Carrie had dated for nearly six months before they both realized they weren't meant for each other. Albert looked on Carrie like a sister and they remained friends. They both knew they would never be any more than friends though. Hi Albert, how's it going? Carrie said as she walked up. She was dressed, as usual, in a pair of tight jeans and a sweater, her preferred uniform for after school and weekends. If the occasion called for it, she could and would look like a million dollars though. Albert, you have a problem. People at school are starting to talk about you and Gary. What kind of talk? Albert asked, although he suspected he knew what Carrie meant. Some people are saying you and Gary are gay, that you're a couple. Some people? Would that be Barbara Smatters, by any chance? Albert asked, but he already knew the answer. Albert slammed the hood of his Camaro and cursed under his breath. Of course. Who else? Well? Well, what? Albert said. Are you guys gay? Albert looked at her for a full minute before she lost the staring contest and began laughing. She was probably the only person in town who could get away with asking the question. We grew up together, 
We were like brothers and I haven't seen him for three years. I didn't quit dating girls, Helen moved of state and I haven't felt like dating anyone else. We were getting pretty close and then bam, she moves out of state. Gary moved away just like Helen and I didn't have another friend to lean on, which is why I got involved in basketball in a big way, Albert said. You don't have to explain to me, I thought I'd let you know. You need to do something about it Albert. Why don't you guys get some girlfriend action going? I know you miss Helen, I'm not suggesting you forget about her, but this would be more for Gary's good than yours, Carrie said. Do you know anyone who might be interested in dating Gary? I know he's asked out a couple of girls, but they're already seeing someone. It's a small senior class and most of the girls already have boyfriends. Maybe you know someone from another school? Albert said. No, and the problem is worse than that. Barbara the bitch has been spreading this rumor pretty heavy. Did you do something to her recently? Well, I just told her yesterday that I wouldn't date her if she was the last girl on the face of the earth. Other than that, no. Albert said with a smile. Where are you alone then? Carrie asked with a grin. She hated Barbara more than anyone else. Yes, she caught me as I was getting into my car after practice and told me how we could be good for each other and she'd make sure I had a good time when I was with her. It was like last year never happened, Albert said. He was referring to Barbara's most infamous stunt to date. She had set it up to take the heat off of her, figuring one scandal would defuse another. Albert walked into the lunchroom one day and after getting his tray of food he looked around for friends to sit with. Helen had a different lunch period so they never got to do any more than say hi at lunch. Albert spied Carrie sitting alone and he went over to sit with her. Albert, come over here. It was Frank Grace from the basketball team. They called him Amazing Grace because if he hit a basket, it was amazing. No thanks, I'm going to sit with Carrie, she's all alone. That's right and there's a reason. Haven't you heard? She's gay, she mailed Barbara Smatters a bunch of naked pictures of herself, Frank said. I don't believe anything that Barbara Smatters says and neither should you. She lied about Mr. Coffee touching her, remember, just last week. They investigated and it turns out Mr. Coffee keeps a video camera going whenever he has students in his classroom alone. She shut up about the touching after that. This is some kind of stunt she's pulled to deflect attention from her. I won't be a part of it. Screw Barbara and her bullshit. Albert sat down next to Carrie and began eating. She looked up at him and smiled. She had obviously been crying though. Don't let them see you cry. They win if they do, Albert told her. Thanks Albert, you were always a good guy, Carrie said. After Albert sat down, a couple of others sat down as well. Lunch passed and after classes, Albert looked up Barbara. What the hell do you think you're doing? She's a nice girl and you're dragging her name through the mud for no good reason. It's true, look for yourself. Barbara handed Albert a couple for photographs of Carrie. Although there were no exposed breasts or genitalia, it was obvious that Carrie was no wearing any clothes when the photos were taken. Barbara, you are so full of shit. In the first place, there's more nudity on NYPD Blue than in these and in the second place, these were taken with your camera. You're the one with a Polaroid Captiva, Carrie has a Nikon 35mm SLR. If she took photos of herself, they'd be a lot better quality. Get smart and just drop this. Don't speak of it again or I'll tell everyone that you took the pictures yourself and then you'll have to explain why you were over at Carrie's house Saturday night after midnight, Albert said. Barbara's eyes opened wide and her mouth opened and closed once. She knew Albert lived next door to Carrie, she didn't know he had seen her over there. Albert, I. Don't say anything, there is nothing that you could say that I would believe at this point. Leave Carrie alone, this is the end of it. If I start talking about you, people will listen, they'll believe me. Albert put the photos in his pocket. Hey, those are mine. Barbara said, Albert didn't reply, he just walked off. The mini scandal had blown over that day. Barbara kept her mouth shut and Albert gave the photos back to Carrie. She never told him how they happened to be taken and he didn't ask. 
He had become aware that Carrie was gay and it didn't bother him. She was a friend and that was all that mattered. She didn't talk with him about her social life and he didn't talk about his. Albert, you probably played into write her web when you said that. I'd suggest that you have a date with someone this weekend and make it public, let a lot of people see you with someone really pretty, Carrie said. Carrie, are you busy tonight? I thought we could catch that new movie everyone was talking about going to and then drop by that real popular dance club for an hour or so, Albert said. Damn it, Albert. I'm trying to help and you're cracking jokes. Hey, you're very pretty and I'd enjoy an evening with you, you'd probably have fun too. No pressure, no expectations, we both know nothing would happen. Albert was grinning but Carrie wasn't. Albert, can we be serious here, I'm trying to make you see the problem. Your reputation could take the hit, but Gary's going to get labeled and that's wrong. You're right, but Carrie, I'm not interested in dating a girl just for show. I really don't want to date anyone around here yet. I really am depressed with Helen leaving. If Gary hadn't shown up, I'd probably be in therapy. Hmm, Albert, I have a suggestion but let's go over to my room, we need to talk privately, okay? Sure, can I get a glass of water, I'm thirsty? The two friends went into Carrie's home and they made their way to Carrie's room. It was a typical teenage girl's room, she had more posters of girl singers than boys but that in itself wasn't unusual. Albert was comfortable sitting in her room and sipping ice water. Albert, you have an open mind, that's why I like you so much. I need you to open it a little wider for the next few minutes, okay? Carrie said. Okay, what did you have in mind? Albert, we need to find Gary a girlfriend. If either of us asks girls to date Gary, it's going to look like you two really are gay and are just trying to cover it up. What you said earlier is right, most of the girls in the junior and senior class are already seeing someone steady. So we need a girl that doesn't go to our school. Do you know what Gary likes in a girl? Well, he talk about the girl he was seeing back in California. Let me guess, blonde hair, blue eyes, no tan lines and really big. Actually no, he showed me her picture, she's pretty to be sure but not some beach bimbo. She had red hair, the color of a sunrise, Gary said in green eyes. She's got a good figure, a lot like yours, he said she's about two inches taller than he is, like you are, Albert said. Was he as hung up on her as you were on Helen? Carrie asked. No, they had dated for a couple of months and then he moved. He misses her but she's already dating someone else and, as I said, he's looking for a girlfriend himself. Albert, do me a favor, close your eyes and remember exactly what the picture of this girl looks like, concentrate really hard on it, okay? Carrie said. What are you going to do while I have my eyes shut? Strip naked and dance around the room, of course. Really, I'm just going to sit here and wait for you to get a clear mental image of the girl, What's her name, by the way? Uh, Shelly, Shelly Lawton, I think. Albert closed his eyes and concentrated, in a minute he told Carrie he had the image okay, keep your eyes closed and hold out your right hand with the fingers spread. Don't lose the image though, Carrie said. Albert did as he was told and Carrie slipped what felt like a ring on his hand. He then felt a wave of cold air swept over him and his entire body shivered. Albert opened his eyes and blinked. He was still in Carrie's room but his perception was changed, the colors seemed off and he felt like he was sitting lower in the chair. Wow, what was that? Hey, my voice. Albert said. Albert, stand up and come over her to my mirror, Carrie said. Albert stood up and he felt even stranger. His center of gravity had shifted, his clothes didn't fit right and something was tickling his neck and laying on his shoulders. He stepped forward and his running shoe came off of his foot. Albert looked in the mirror and screamed. Carrie! I'm, I'm a, a, girl. I'm a girl. Yes, you are. Now calm down, it's okay. The hell it is. I'm Shelly, Gary's girlfriend from California. What the hell did you do to me? Carrie took the ring off of Albert's finger and guided him back to the chair. She pressed a stone in his hand and told him to be quiet and relax. Albert was close to hyperventilating and she needed to get him quiet before someone heard him screaming. 
Her parents were gone shopping but Albert had been screaming pretty loud and his new higher-pitched voice really carried. Albert felt the stone in his hand grow slightly warmer and he began to feel better, his breathing slowed and he regained some control. In another minute, he was still upset but he could talk in a normal tone of voice. Carrie, what happened? Albert, I'm going to tell you something that you wouldn't have believed a few minutes ago, I'm a sorceress. My mother is one too. She's teaching me how to be one anyway. The stone you're holding is the first magical item I made. It's called a soothing stone. It's like a tranquilizer only it works faster, it's not habit-forming and it lasts forever, except it needs to recharge after it's been used. Carrie took the stone and placed it in a jewelry box. Now, what happened was the result of the magical ring that I made. I went to a jewelry store and bought a pure silver ring. I then gave the ring the power to change the wearer into the person they was imaging at the moment he or she puts it on, Carrie said. Carrie, I don't want to be a girl, I'm happy as a boy, I want to change back, you should have told me what you were doing before you did it, Albert said. If I had told you, you wouldn't have believed it and the ring would not have worked. It uses the person's own energy to make the change and if you thought it couldn't happen, it wouldn't. Now you know the ring works, you can use it as often as you like. If you want to change back to Albert, go right ahead, but I did this so we could help Gary. Carrie, what are suggesting is the same thing that Barbara is spreading around, you're suggesting that I date Gary. Carrie was trying hard not to smile but she failed miserably. What's so funny? Albert said. You're really cute when you're angry, you know that? Oh. Ha ha, make fun of me, that's nice. Give me back the ring and let's just forget this ever happened. Albert, didn't you just tell me that if it hadn't been for Gary, you'd probably be in therapy right now? Carrie asked. Yes, in fact, your mother spoke to me about my feelings after Helen moved off. My mom talked to her about how worried she was about me. Gary moved back to town just a day later and I let your mom know I was feeling better. She told me I could come see her anytime though. Carrie's mother was a psychologist. Then don't you think you owe him something? I'm not suggesting you have sex with him. I thought you could date him a couple of times, let others see him with a pretty girl and then maybe he'd find his own girlfriend, Carrie said. Carrie, this is so weird, what if someone finds out? Albert asked. Do you think I'd tell anyone? Carrie asked. No. I don't, Alert said. Are you going to tell anyone? Carrie asked. No. Then who's going to find out? Albert thought about it for a few minutes and realized it wasn't nearly as bad an idea as he had first thought. Sure it was weird to the extreme but it was to help out his friend. Besides, haven't you ever wondered what it was like to be a girl? Carrie asked. Albert felt his face get hot. He realized he must be blushing. It was a thought that had occurred to him from time to time but he had never expected to experience it. Okay, I'll try it once and we'll see how it goes. Maybe once will be enough. But I can't walk up to Gary looking just like his former girlfriend, he'll suspect something and I'm not telling him about this, no way, Albert said. That's right, I wanted to use Shelly for a guide. We'll construct a girl that reminds him of Shelly and it'll be easier for you to get him interested in dating you. At least it seems to make sense. Worst case scenario, you get passed over and Gary has to find his own girl. First thing, you need to be the same size as me. That way I can lend you some of my clothes, except panties, you'll have to buy some of your own. Now, let's get started in redesigning you as Gary's dream girl, Carrie said. An hour later, Albert and Carrie were satisfied with the results. Using the ring, Albert would revise the mental image of the girl he had become and then change his body to fit that new image. The new girl was the same dress size as Carrie, C-cup breasts, which Albert had a hard time keeping his hands off of, slim waist and nicely flared hips. She had very good legs and a dazzling smile. Her lips were fuller than Carrie, Carrie had always wanted fuller lips for herself, and she had reddish blonde hair with a lot of large, soft, natural curl to it. Albert, if I was going to change myself, you're what I'd look like except I'd keep my hair brown. You are gorgeous. Gary won't stand a chance. 
Every other girl in school is going to hate for being so good looking and wonder what Gary has that attracted a beauty like you. This is going to work, I know it will, Carrie said. Albert looked at the new person he was. She was a beautiful girl all right, he just wasn't sure he was up to the task at hand. Carrie, I'm not sure I know how to behave on a date as a girl. Sure you do, you've dated a number of girls, just do what they did. Smile when Gary talks to you, listen to what he has to say, talk about him and his interests, let him make the decisions, in other words, let him be in charge. Guys like that, it makes them feel manly and that's okay when you're dating, Carrie said. But what about, you know, kissing and stuff? Albert asked. What about it? You like Gary, he's a guy, right now, you're a girl. If you want to, kiss him, no one will think anything about it except you. If you want to kiss him, I would hope that you would, Carrie said. Albert, sit down and let me explain something. You are no longer Albert, he exists but he's absent right now. Everyone who knows Albert remembers him and they don't remember you because you've never been around before. You have no identification and no history. We'll need to make one up, something simple. You're a girl, a real girl. You and Gary are friends, close friends. It makes sense that you may want to kiss Gary and hold his hand and even more. That's up to you. You need to be careful, you can get pregnant. I don't know what would happen if you did. The ring might no longer change you back. I would avoid sex unless you used two forms of birth control, at least. If you find that you just have to experience sex with a guy as a girl, think again and make sure that you are prepared for the consequences. This is very important. Did you understand what I said? Carrie asked. Yes, and you're right. I just thought about Gary and I do like him. I find that I feel differently about him. I get a warm feeling when I think about him. Is that normal? Wait, I just realized. It was the same feeling I got when I would think about Helen but I don't get that feeling when I think about her now, why? Albert said. Because, you're a heterosexual girl and so is she. Albert, no, we need to change that name now. What do you want to be called when you're a girl? Hmm, how about Sheila, it's close to Shelly and it'll remind me that I'm a she now. Sheila smiled, even without makeup, she was lovely. Okay, now we need a history, something short and sweet. Gary's only lived in California and here so let's if Sheila come from Ohio, let's say Columbus. Your family moved here because your dad got a new job and you're an only child. You live on the other side of town and go to Northside High. That's simple and easy to remember. Anything else, just make it up and try to remember it. You shouldn't have to keep it up too long. Now, we need to get you into a skirt and a pretty blouse, Carrie said. Why a skirt? You're wearing jeans. Because I'm not out looking for a guy and you are. Let's see, with your coloring, lots of things I have will look good. Here, try this one and this and this and I'll show you how to put this on. Carrie was throwing different garments at Sheila and she tried to catch and identify them as they sailed through the air. She was given a dark green, silk blouse, a short, black leather skirt and a pair of black pantyhose. A plain white cotton bra and a pair of new, white, cotton panties. I bought some new panties last week and I haven't worn those. Women don't like to share panties, it's a very personal item. If you become Sheila again, you'll need to wash those out and keep them somewhere or buy a few more pair. Let me show you the right way to put on a bra. I think it looks better and fits better if you do it this way, Carrie said. She then proceeded to take her sweatshirt and bra off and show Sheila how a girl puts on a bra and adjusts her beasts for optimum comfort and appearance. Sheila discovered she enjoyed that lesson a great deal but not because she got to see Carrie's breasts, that did nothing for her at all. What Sheila enjoyed was the way her breasts felt when she adjusted them. Wow, I was right, you're going to be a knockout. Okay now some makeup and perfume, Carrie said. Sheila didn't argue, she had looked at herself in the mirror and she agreed with Carrie, she could use some makeup to tone down her freckles and highlight her eyes. It was almost instinctual, the feeling that her eyes were one of the best features of her face. Sheila was a quick study and soon she was made up and scented just right. Okay girlfriend, 
Now where do we find Gary? Carrie asked the transformed boy. I told him I'd meet him at the mall, that is Albert said that. It's strange, I feel like Albert is another person, is that normal? Sheila said. Well, magic affects us all in different ways, some are more acutely affected than others. I'm not sure about how it's affected you other than to say, damn you are cute. If Gary passes you by, Sheila, and there is zero chance of that, keep me in mind, okay? Carrie laughed out loud when she said this to make sure her friend knew she was kidding. Carrie kept her jeans on but put on a nicer looking blouse and they headed to the mall. They agreed they would split up and Carrie would be a safe distance away so that no one connected the two, just to be safe. If Sheila had an emergency, Carrie would there to help. She had left the ring at home, changing into Albert wasn't an option in the tight, girl-sized clothes Sheila was wearing. Sheila was wearing a pair of low, black heels. She had a little trouble walking in them at first, but soon got the hang of it. Albert had told Gary to meet him at the food court, near the information booth. They had planned on seeing a movie and Gary wanted to prowl for girls, he knew Albert was still getting over Helen. Sheila spotted Gary, she felt her mouth go dry and her heart began pounding. She was sweating but she was determined to see this through. It was for Gary. She had stopped in front of a dress shop near the entrance she had come in and seen her reflection in a full-length mirror and was shocked at how very attractive she was. The view of herself served to give her confidence, no one would suspect she was a guy, and as Carrie pointed out, she wasn't. She walked past Gary, who was seated at a table, looking at other girls walking by. She glanced his way and they made eye contact, she smiled at him and he returned it. Her heart skipped a beat when he did, she had to will herself to move on and let him make the first move as Carrie had told her to, she had to let him be in charge. Sheila walked up to the taco burrito and ordered a Diet Coke, Gary was at her elbow, asking if he could pay for it. Why, yes, thank you, I'm Sheila, what's your name? She held out her hand and remembered to not squeeze back when he took it. Gary, Gary Grady. I just moved here from California but I used to live here before, I don't remember seeing you around the mall before. No, I just moved here from Columbus, Ohio. My dad got transferred and up we went. I wanted to finish my senior year in my old school but I couldn't be apart from my parents that long, Sheila said. Me too, I thought about staying in Fresno for my senior year but family's more important, I think, Gary said. Gary and Sheila talked for an hour, Gary mentioned a friend he was supposed to meet but he guessed he got tied up. He asked Sheila to a movie and she accepted. Gary wanted to drive Sheila home but she said her parents were picking her up and she had to wait for them or they'd be worried. Gary had to get home to take care of some chores. He wanted to stay and talk all night and said so. Sheila, I've never felt so comfortable with a girl before, not right after I met her. I hope I can see you again sometime? Gary said. I'd like that, Gary, I don't have a phone number right now, it isn't hooked up yet. Why don't you give me your number and I'll call you sometime? Sheila said. Gary gave her his number and she put the slip of paper in her backpack purse Carrie had loaned her. Gary said goodbye and held out his hand. Sheila took his hand and leaned over and kissed his cheek. She blushed when she realized what she had done but Gary was beaming afterwards. Sheila made sure Gary was gone before finding Carrie's car in the parking lot. It was dark now so no one noticed whose car she got in. Well, how'd it go? Carrie asked. It was really fun, we talked and he took me to a movie and… Did you like it when he put his arm around you in the movie? Carrie asked with a grin. Did you follow us? Sheila asked. Nope, I saw you two heading for the multiplex theater and figured I'd watch one too and you happened to pick the same one. I was already in my seat when you two walked in. Carrie said. He wants to see me again and I've got his number but I don't know. I really like Gary, I'm not sure I want to take a chance of hurting him. She told Carrie what he had said about feeling comfortable with Sheila from the beginning. Why would you hurt him? Carrie asked. Because if he fell in love with me, like Albert was in love with Helen, when Sheila leaves, he'll be hurt like Albert was. If I just never call him, it'll never happen. 
I know several of the guys from the basketball team saw Gary and me together, I think that we'll just let this be Sheila's one and only appearance, Sheila said. Carrie, thank you, you've given me an insight into being a girl and let me help a friend. If there is ever anything I can do for you, let me know. Sheila said. Hey, Albert already did that, I was repaying a debt. I know, but Sheila may be able to help you some time, just let me know. The two girls hugged and then went back to Carrie's house. Carrie's parents were in the living room reading. Carrie tried to sneak Sheila in but her mother called them into the living room. Her parents had accepted Carrie's lifestyle choice but, like most parents, they liked to know who their daughter was seeing. Hello, I'm Carrie's mother, Dr. Kingston, please call me Joanna and this is my husband, Kyle. Carrie's father was involved in a magazine and looked up for just a second and smiled. Hi, I'm Sheila Lincoln. I just came by to listen to some music with Carrie. They shook hands and Joanna Kingston got a funny look on her face. Sheila, have we met before somewhere? I get the feeling that I know you from somewhere. No, I don't believe so, Sheila said. She was a little leery of lying to Carrie's mother but technically, Sheila and Joanna had never met. Okay, you girls have fun, keep it down to below earthquake levels, okay Carrie? Her mother said. Sure mom, I'm going to get us some drinks, okay? Carrie asked. Yes, dear, and she returned to her reading. Carrie got them each a Diet Coke and they went to her bedroom. So, how about some nude photos before you change back? Carrie said. Both girls laughed out loud about that one. That bitch Barbara, I wish there was something I could do to her to make her sorry she ever lied about someone, Sheila said. Really? Carrie asked. Sure really. Don't you feel the same way? I mean she had to really do a number on you to come over that night and let her take pictures and all, Sheila said. I have a spell book I'm not supposed to have, it's very advanced. I got it over the internet from a little bookstore in Leeds, England. It's got spells in it that we could cast on Barbara so that every time she lies, something happens to her, Carrie said. What do you mean, you're not supposed to have it? Sheila asked. Mom has these ideas about me using magic that I'm not experienced enough for, like that ring I made. She's have a fit if she knew I did that and then let you use it. Carrie, what are you saying? Is there a problem? I have to change back into Albert. Sheila isn't a real person. Oh, calm down. It changed you again and again this afternoon. It'll change you back into Albert. But let's do something to Barbara first. I need your help. Females have more power to focus and with two of use reciting the incantation it will be more likely to work. Carrie got the large, leather-bound book from under her bed and opened it. She flipped through much of the book before coming to rest on a page with a picture of a dew on it. Here, this is perfect. Basically it says when the victim of the curse utters a falsehood, they will assume the shape of a dog until released from the curse by the one who set the curse, Carrie said. Carrie. I'm not sure about this. I mean changing someone into a dog is pretty serious. And so is lying about you and Gary and about the history teacher as well. She'll just keep it up until she either hurts someone or gets elected to public office. Come on, let's cast the spell and then we can go over to her house and wait for her to change into a real bitch. It can't take that long for her to lie, Carrie said. Against her better judgment, Sheila agreed. Besides, she told Carrie she'd help her if she ever needed it and if this worked, maybe Barbara would be a better person. It was much simpler than Sheila had suspected. They lit a few candles, drew a pentagram on the carpet in colored chalk and recited the incantation. When they were finished, all of the candles blew out. Carrie turned the lights back on and started making notes in a notebook. What's that? Sheila asked. The release, I just have to repeat it when I see Barbara after she's changed, then she'll change back. Come on, I have an idea. Carrie and Sheila left the house, telling Carrie's mother they were running up to the mall for a few minutes. As Carrie suspected, Barbara was in the food court with several of her hangers on around her. She was pretty and smart and she could control the slower students. The plan was for Sheila, who no one knew to go to Barbara and ask her a question that they were sure she would lie about when she answered. 
then watch the fun. Hi, I'm Sheila Lincoln, aren't you Barbara Smatters? Yes I am, I don't think I've ever seen you before. Yes, I just moved to town last week from Ohio. I heard something about you and I wondered if it was true. Are you and Albert Connors an item, because if you aren't I'd like to date him. Sheila, take it back to Ohio, he's mine, signed sealed and delivered, Barbara said. Just then, Barbara began to shake. Her eyes crossed and she began moaning. She fell out of her seat and wound up on the floor on her hands and knees, she began coughing but the cough soon turned into barks and then growls as Barbara's body began reshaping itself. A coat of fur began growing, the same color as her blonde hair. Her face got longer, her long hair fell out and was replaced with fur. Her ears moved to the top of her head and then grew pointed. Her teeth grew long and pointed. While she still had hands, she ripped the clothes from her body as if they were causing her pain. When she got her blouse off, her bra covered a fur-coated, flat chest that was changing shape as she watched. In less than a minute, Barbara Smatters had gone from a very attractive 18-year-old girl to a gold-colored mutt. A mixed-bred female dog. The dog began to whine although it was hard to hear it over the screams and shouts of the people in the mall who witnessed the event. Carrie came close and slipped a collar over the dog and led her out of the mall. Amazingly, no one tried to stop her. Sheila picked up the rags that Barbara was wearing and her purse and followed. Once outside, Carrie sat down on a bench and Sheila sat next to her, the dog who used to be Barbara sat down in front of them, whining loudly. Barbara, shut up, right now, Carrie said and the dog was quiet. Do you want to stay this way? Carrie asked. The dog began barking and whining again. I'll take that as a no, I changed you, I can change you back but you have to agree to my conditions, are you willing? The dog nodded her head up and down. Okay, if you ever spread a rumor about anyone else, ever again, I'll change you back into a dog and leave you that way. I don't care if the rumor is true or not, don't spread tales, it's not nice, is that clear? Carrie said. And of course, you can't tell anyone about this. If you break your word, I change you back into a dog. The dog barked and spun around. I hope that means yes, oh, you ripped your clothes off. Did you drive yourself here? The dog looked off toward a blue car that Sheila and Carrie recognized as Barbarous. Okay, then let's put you in the car and you can drive yourself home. It'll be up to you to get into the house from there. Carrie and Sheila walked over to the car and opened the door. The dog jumped into the driver's seat and sat down. Carrie took the spell out of her pocket and together she and Sheila read it. Barbara began to shake and whine and yelp as if in pain then her fur began to fall out. Soon she was changing back into a girl. After a minute or so, the change was complete. She was completely naked and very angry. She promised to get even. Take your best shot Barbara, just answer one thing for me now. Will you prefer dry or canned dog food? Carrie asked. Barbara turned pale and drove off, uttering under her breath. The two girls laughed all the way home and when they returned, Carrie's parents were in their bedroom. The door wasn't closed so Carrie went in to say goodnight and let them know that Sheila would leave before midnight. Back in Carrie's room, Sheila was looking at her reflection in the mirror again. She had freshened her makeup, she wanted Carrie to take her picture for a keepsake. Carrie obliged and then she handed Sheila the ring. I hope you come back to visit again Sheila, it was a lot of fun having you as a girlfriend, Carrie told her. Thanks Carrie, I enjoyed it too. She closed her eyes and got a mental image of Albert and then slipped the ring on, nothing happened. Carrie, is this the right ring? Sheila asked. Yes, it is, it's the right ring, it's the only silver ring I have. Here, let me try something. Carrie closed her eyes for a second and slipped the ring on, her lips got fuller almost instantly. Carrie opened her eyes and licked her lips and then looked at the mirror, she smiled then she took the ring off and lay it on the dresser. Immediately she picked it back up and closed her eyes for a few seconds and then slipped the ring back on, her lips returned to normal. I don't understand, it worked several times this afternoon, why doesn't it work on you now? Carrie, where's the book that you used to make this ring, maybe that'll tell you what's wrong? Sheila said. 
They looked at the book for over an hour and couldn't see what was wrong. Finally, Carrie went to see her mother. Joanna and Carrie returned to Carrie's room. Sheila was sitting on the bed, quietly crying, very afraid of what was going to happen to her and Albert. Joanna had the two girls tell her everything that they had done and said that day and night. She got very angry looking when she heard about Barbara. She stopped long enough to call and make sure that Barbara had gotten home okay. She told Barbara that she had heard there was a commotion at the mall and she was concerned because she had heard that Barbara was upset about it. Barbara just said she was fine and hung up. After they had explained the events, Joanna asked Sheila what she felt and thought during the day and she told her. Albert or Sheila, which do you prefer? That's an important question. Joanna said. I feel like Albert's someone else, someone close and that I care about but a different person, I don't want Albert to be gone for good but I don't want Sheila to leave either. Sheila, I'm afraid that you have made a life choice here. Part of it has to do with your loss and grieving over Helen leaving. You knew how lonely you were after Gary went away the first time and then you thought it had happened again. Let me talk to Carrie for a few minutes, Carrie give her the soothing stone while you and I go into the living room to talk. Mother and daughter went into the living room together. Carrie, you are in so much trouble right now. If I were you I wouldn't make any plans for the next decade, and don't get that shocked to me, look on your face, young lady. Do you realize what it is you've done? Albert's probably not coming back, Sheila is the dominant personality now. This is why I told you to leave the advanced magic for when you were older, Joanna said. Magic is an art, not a science. It takes a lot of practice to get it right. You were right when you said magic affects everyone differently and experience is what helps us know when it's a bad idea to cast a spell on someone. You could have left Barbara stuck in a dog's body. I can't believe that you really wanted to do that, did you? No mom, I didn't want to hurt anyone, I love Albert. Isn't there something you could do, get some more sorceresses together and change her back? Carrie pleaded. No. We can't undo a spell you cast. The best we can hope for is to help Sheila have a life. It's a big job, but doable. You go into your room and keep Sheila company. I have some calls to make. Joanna Kingston called a number of fellow sorceresses and they agreed to gather that very evening. When she had enough she called Carrie and Sheila into the living room and explained what would happen. Sheila, you are a woman now and always will be. I can't change that, no one can. Part of the problem is a spell that was improperly cast and it shouldn't have been cast with Albert in the condition he was in to begin with. We can't change reality, but we can cast a spell on Sheila and every piece of paper dealing with Albert Connors. From now on, when anyone looks at Sheila, they will remember her as if she had been Albert. You will have the same grades and school records as Albert but everyone will see the name Sheila Connors instead of Albert. This is complicated and we'll probably miss something. If someone finds a document with Albert Connors on it, you'll have to make something up. I know it's not perfect but it's the best that I can do, Joanna said. There is a consequence to this, in all likelihood, Gary Grady is going to be in love with you. Now that may be okay with you and if he is, it's real love, not magic. He'll remember you as the girl he grew up next to. Your finding each other again after your boyfriend moved away was great timing as far as you're both concerned. What about my parents? Will they remember Albert or Sheila? Sheila asked. Sheila, their memories will be the ones we work the hardest on. How are you feeling now? Joanna asked. Better, I like being Sheila and I liked being with Gary today. I think I can get used to it okay. Please don't be mad at Carrie. Sheila said. Sheila. What if you didn't like being Sheila? What if you wanted to be a boy again? I wouldn't be able to help you, not with magic. It's not a toy, it's a serious power that demands the utmost of control and consideration. Carrie isn't the only one who's made mistakes like this. I used to have three brothers, now I have two and a sister. When I was much younger than Carrie, I used a spell to turn my newborn baby brother into a little baby girl. I wanted a sister and I knew how to do it. 
Fortunately, it was done in the first few hours after she was born and it didn't have any adverse effects. She's a happy and healthy young woman. I can never tell her what I did and I was wrong to do it. Carrie will have to be punished for what she's done today. The fact that it turned out okay is immaterial. It shouldn't have happened. The incantation session lasted well over 12 hours and when it was finished, Sheila went home to find a teenage girl's room, much like Carrie's. She was never asked to explain who Albert Connors was. Carrie was punished with the loss of her driving privileges for six months. It simply meant that Carrie and Sheila went a lot of places together, when Sheila wasn't out with Gary or playing on the girls' basketball team. Gary and Sheila went to college together and in their senior year, Gary proposed. They graduated and were married in the same week. Carrie found a female life partner who also practiced magic, they kept each other amused and happy for many years. Barbara Smatters became a veterinarian, her practice is restricted to dogs. Frank Amazing Grace is a starter for the Dallas Mavericks professional basketball team. His scoring percentage has not improved a bit.